Hey, look, Jamal Murray has been really, really good in this series, CJ, and he's presented a big problem for the Phoenix Suns. So let's talk defensively now. How might the Suns best try to attack him defensively in a series they're down 2-0? Well, Jamal Murray is a fantastic player. He's having a great postseason, averaging 25.7 points per game. Uh, didn't play particularly well in game two, but I don't expect that to happen in game three. I think from a defensive standpoint, you got to get into him. You got to pressure him. You got to pick him up full court and try to wear him down. Now, he's great in pick and roll. He's a great catch and shoot player, as you see right here, him knocking down the three. And he can also play in isolation and has a great spin fadeaway uh, that where he kind of pivots and, and shoots step backs. But I think for them, uh, the Phoenix Suns team, they got to go at him defensively. They got to attack him. Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, they got to try to wear him out by making him guard on defense because he's so potent offensively and so crucial to that team's pick and roll between him and the Joker. Um, you got to try to wear him down as best you can, but I don't expect him to have two poor shooting games in a row. I expect him to play extremely well, but I do think the Suns are going to win game three. I ultimately pick the Suns to win the series to start and with the Chris Paul injury. I feel like uh, the Denver Nuggets are destined for greatness and have played extremely well at home. Yeah, you speak of a joker, too. I think it's going to be imperative for DeAndre Ayton to do something, be yeah. physical, finish shots, grab rebounds. That's one side of it for the Phoenix Suns. You just mentioned the CP3 injury. It seems to be his bugaboo threat his career in the playoffs. So now you've got KD Booker Ayton. How do they replace that offensive production? What does this mean for the Suns without CP3? Yeah, I don't think you can necessarily replace what CP does because he's, he's the maestro. Like, he, he runs the offense. He, he gets KD shots. He gets book shots. He makes sure everybody's in the right spots. He feeds Aiton as well. So I think they're going to they're gonna miss him out there. But look for Book to do a lot of ball handling. Look for KD to, to, to kind of be extremely aggressive, understanding that this is a must-win situation for them. And the biggest issue for the Suns since the Kevin Durant trade has been production from the others. You know what you're going to get from Book. You know what you're going to get from KD. I think they may combine for 70 points tonight, but it's about the role players stepping up. And I think in the playoffs historically, role players have played well at home. I think campaign's going to play well. I think Aiden, understanding what he's gone through these first couple games against Joker, he's going to look to be more aggressive, try to get some elbow touches, try to get some offensive rebounds, and really put his impact on this game. Because if he doesn't, if that third player doesn't step up for the Phoenix Suns, this series could be over in four or five games. And you hit on it. Everyone focuses on the KD trade because it brought an all-timer to the Suns lineup. They gave up a lot in depth to make that happen. Suns have just a 1-16 series record when trailing 2-0. Sage? All right, Matt, Eastern Conference, the early game tonight in Philly. Game three, Celtics, Sixers with the series all tied up. But one, here's how we got here. Philly took game one. You may recall in Boston, surprising a lot of people, Boston took game two. They came back. Across NBA history, when a best of seven series is tied at one, the winner of game three goes on to win 73% of the time. In this postseason, those teams and those situations are also a perfect 4-0. The Seas are on the road in this one, but it hasn't slowed them down in recent history. They're 10-5 and five on the road over the last two postseasons. That's the most wins of any team and the best winning percentage over that span as well. But they're not afraid to go on the road. If Philly wants to take the series lead, they're likely going to need a better performance from this guy. James Harden. He had an incredible game one performance, right? 45 points. Joel Embiid was out for that one. He followed up with a lackluster 12 points, though, just two of 14 shooting in game two. And CJ, it's really incredible. It almost reminds me a little bit of, of, of Anthony Davis, right? Great in game one, nowhere in game two. And it's kind of the same thing with James Harden, especially just two of 14 from the floor. You mentioned yesterday, CJ, that he needed to be more aggressive. What exactly does that look like? I think more aggressive for James doesn't necessarily equate to more shots. I think it's about putting pressure on the rim, right? Finding your matchups, looking to get Al Horford in pick and roll, looking to get Jalen Brown off of you or Marcus Smart off of you, and taking more than six threes. In game one, he shot seven of 14 from three. He was over 50% from the field and dropped 45 points. I don't need him to do that again, and I don't think the Sixers expect him to do that again, but they want to see the value of three-pointers raised. They want to see him take and make big shots when Joel Embiid needs him to. I think putting pressure on the rim, getting to the free throw line, and getting up more threes would be very, very beneficial to James Harden and the Sixers team. I don't expect him uh, to go two for 12 again or two for 14 again from the field. I think he'll play a lot better at home. I think understanding that Joel Embiid is going to be uh, less rusty than he was in game yeah. one. They're going to be playing in front of those Sixer fans, and JoJo's getting, getting his trophy, right? He's, he's going to get the plaque for MVP. 
And I think everything will be well in game three for the Sixers. Yeah, and, and you know what? If you don't come out big with that celebration with the MVP, then something's wrong. By the way, it's been almost three weeks since this team has played at home. Last time was April 17th against the Nets. So a very long time ago. I know, a long time. We will see what happens tonight. 730 tip on an emotional night sure to be in Philly. Thank you, CJ. This was a surprise nonetheless as Adrian Wojnarowski joins us now. Woj, you broke the story. Milwaukee just two years removed from the championship run. Giannis hurt most of the series against Miami. Why did the franchise make this move now? Hey, Matt, it, it, as much as anything, I think this is a projection for this Bucks organization on who they need moving forward. I don't think it's an indictment on the success Mike Budenholzer has had as head coach, winning a championship in 2021, almost a 700 winning percentage in the regular season with Milwaukee. Uh, but as you mentioned, getting bounced in the first round against the Miami Heat. Uh, this is a crossroads for this organization roster-wise. Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, both uh, with impending free agencies. They, of course, would love to get Giannis Antetokounmpo signed to another extension. Uh, but five years of, of Mike Budenholzer in Milwaukee. He's got two years, uh, $16 million plus left on his contract. He will coach again in the NBA. He is a great program builder, did it in uh, Atlanta, and did it again with the Bucks. Well, a quick follow-up on that, because I bet your phone looked amazing yesterday. What was the reaction around the league when this news came down just before 6 o'clock? Well, certainly, you know, I think uh, some surprise because of the success Budenholzer has had, but this is an organization now you know, that gets out in the marketplace. This is a very attractive coaching job, and, and I think not just – uh, candidates who are, you know, I would say, technically available right now, whether it be assistant coaches on other teams uh, uh, or former head coaches, but perhaps even coaches under contract elsewhere in the NBA. See how these playoffs, uh, see how situations shake out. They've got a great internal candidate, Charles Lee, their associate head coach, who's a candidate right now in Detroit and Toronto, a future head coach in the league. But this Milwaukee organization led by John Horst, their GM, who I know agonized over this decision on uh, Mike Budenholzer. Uh, he has a, a, a tremendous roster organization uh, to sell. Uh, this is going to be, they're gonna have no shortage of, of really interested candidates around the league to replace Budenholzer. Yeah, you would think this will be a coveted job as Budenholzer just the fourth coach in the past 50 seasons to lead his team to the best record in the NBA and not return the following season that according to Elias Woj thank you with Bud's yeah. firing that now means that Steve Kerr is the only title winning coach over the last four seasons that remains with their team remember Nick Nurse parted away with the Raptors earlier this offseason and the Lakers fired Frank Vogel last offseason before hiring Darvin Ham thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube for live streaming sports and premium content subscribe to ESPN plus